afternoon, everybody. Let's see some hands back here. You guys can hear me. You guys feeling good? Praise Jesus. Trying to get the blood moving. You guys want to stand with us this morning? I mean, it looks like just a bright early morning, but it's actually afternoon. But this is just a lovely day. We're inside here because we're going to worship Jesus. We could be outside, but unfortunately, we're in here, which is great. We're just happy to have you all. So feel free to stand if you're able. Who here loves Jesus? I just want to hear your voice. Isn't it? Amen. We're going to be lifting up the name of Jesus this morning, starting off. We're going to sing aloud. Remember, everything that has breath, let's praise the Lord. So let's worship him this morning. Heaven. 
Well, let's sing it, nothing. Nothing's gonna stop us singing your praise. Nothing in the world will stand in the way. Oh, God's people lifting Jesus up. Here we go. You're never, you're never gonna stop us. Hearts ablaze. Shout a hallelujah to his name. the mighty name of Jesus in this place. He is our Savior. He is our King. That's why we raise a hallelujah. He died on the cross, but He rose again. And we are saved through Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Sing a little 
little louder, louder than the unbelief. Sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. Sing a little louder. Heaven comes to sing out again. Sing, oh, sing a little louder in the presence of my enemies. Sing, Jesus, that you will meet with us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can go ahead and start that next song, dear Brown. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Father. But it won't prosper When the darkness falls It won't prevail The God I know knows only how to triumph My God will never fail That's right, our God Our God will never fail 
Cause I'm gonna see victory. I'm gonna see victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Who has a battle? I'm gonna see victory. I'm gonna see victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will. down from many giants cause I know I know how the story ends I know how the story ends I'm gonna see victory I'm gonna see victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going, I'm going to see victory. I'm going to see victory. Yes, Lord. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Just raise your battle to Him. I'm going to see victory. I'm going to see victory. For the battle belongs to you. what the enemy meant for you and you turn it for good to turn it for good you take you take what the enemy meant for you and you turn it for good yes you turn it for good you take what the enemy you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good One well, last time You take You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good yes, you turn it for good I'm gonna see victory I'm gonna see victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see victory
worthy of. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. Jesus, the name. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Yes, Lord. We live for you. Sing us out, holy. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. you open up my eyes in one. And show me, show me who you are and feel me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me worthy of every song we could ever sing praise we could ever pray worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you we live for you jesus the name jesus the name above every other name jesus the only one we could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live, we live for you, we live for you, only, only, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, we open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and
There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around one last time. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Come on, church, let's keep pressing in. Ask him to fill your heart today and to lead you into love for those around you. Jesus, thank you that you are here. Thank you for your presence. We say you are worthy. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You sit high, higher than any other being. We exalt your name. We worship you. We adore you, God. Thank you so much, God, for your love. We receive your love and we give it back. We love you, Lord. Church, say that. We love you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you that you, you declare that we are more than conquerors. You declare that we are a new creation. You declare that we are made right, righteous because of your blood. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your spirit. Thank you for what you're doing in this moment. Let's just be still and know that he is God. Just be still. Just focus on him. you sing over us. You dance around us when we are unaware. Thank you, God, that you give us authority through the blood of Jesus. Let's loosen th some things from heaven today. We loosen love in this place. We loosen joy in this place. May peace be loosened from heaven for this place. For God, let, let it be on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you for that spiritual truth. Whatever we loose in heaven, it has to manifest on earth. So God, let us be warriors. Let us be diligently hearing you and seeking you after, after today, for today. Lord, we exalt your name. Thank you so much. Just thank you, God. So let's... Let's close in worship. And uh, yeah, thank you, God. I'm just going to pray for the offering. Lord, I thank you so much for the tithes and offerings that we are giving. It's all for your kingdom. It's all for you to build upon whatever it is you want us to build. I pray that you'd bless the work of our hands and just increase, God, increase the finances of your people. Thank you for their faithfulness. I thank you for their generosity. I pray that you would uh, really just help them reap whatever they're sowing. For God, that is another spiritual truth that we acknowledge and we revere you, Lord. We fear your holy name. May this be a church that truly fears you because when we fear you, wisdom comes. And when wisdom comes, we will experience more of you, more of your knowledge, more understanding, more of your peace. God, I pray that you'd bless uh, the children today as they are going to learn more about your word. So God, anoint all of your, all of your kids. 
I pray that uh, you would just truly prosper them today and throughout the week. Thank you that you, you go before them, you protect them, you are speaking to them always, and they are the next generation. So thank you for the next generation. God, um, I also just want to thank you for the youth ministry. Thank you that you're sending new parents, new children. You are just increasing um, the work done at Hope for today because we, we are just working for you. So thank you, God. Bless the people today throughout the week. And I pray that you would really uh, just soften their hearts so that they would hear the message today. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. So if we have any kids, you are more than welcome to join Megan as she makes her way to the back. We bless the kids. We bless the offering. We looked at how Jesus had restored the call of God on all his people. All the people who call upon his name that they would be shining lights, right? They would be beacons of hope in the world. And before he ascended, he gave them a great commission to go into the world and proclaim the gospel. And he also said that they would receive power from on high, the promised Holy Spirit. And so his ascension into heaven signaled that they were in fact to take charge and to go with his empowerment. But he said, wait first for the Holy Spirit to come. And so we looked at how the Holy Spirit was poured out and they received power to witness. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, as a bit of a recap, in verse 16 he says, no one lights a lamp but puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand. And it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. And later on, Jesus went on saying that in the world you will see false prophets, there'll be deception, there'll be lawlessness, it'll multiply. Even the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And we looked at that wasn't the end of it. He says, but then the good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to the nations. And you guess it, how was that proclamation going to unfold? Through the followers of Jesus Christ. And that includes us today because Paul, who penned a letter to the Corinthian church several years, several years, decades after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he tells the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, that we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And we were encouraged by understanding that just like the disciples, like us today, that we're not alone, that we have the Holy Spirit, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So it's not in our resolve, it's not in our resources, it's not in the might, it's not in the resource, but it's in our trust in who the Holy Spirit is and what he's going to do in and through our life. And so here today, we want to continue part two of the awakening of renewal and blessing through the discipline of prayer. The discipline of prayer. Do we have any prayer warriors here? Who likes to begin their day with a word of prayer? Okay, what about in the afternoon? How about in the evening? Maybe just before your head hits the pillow. That's, that's my main time. That's my big time is before my head hits the pillow. And I'm, through this series, I've been praying, Lord Jesus, give me dreams. Give me visions. Show me what you are doing. Give me words of knowledge for people. Specific word about person, place, or thing they may, that I may minister your good deeds to them. 
to lavish your love on them. Prayer is important. So we're going to go to Acts. Read where it says the Holy Spirit has promised, Acts chapter 1, verse 4. We're just going to go through it just for the sake of uh, convenience, but also fire for effect, if you will. And so while he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, you have heard me speak about. For John the Baptist baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom of Israel at this time? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And down to verse 12, after Christ has ascended, the writer says, and they returned to Jerusalem for the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, about a Sabbath day journey away. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. And they were continually united in prayer along with the women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers." And so what you got to love about this is the ascension has happened. My goodness, they just saw the risen Christ ascend into heaven. Maybe he's starting to build up faith like everything he said is true. It's coming true. He's ascended to heaven and he's given us this commission. And we see here in verse 14 that they're all gathered together in prayer. What I love about this in verse 13, it shows it's a full house. There's something about when you go to a place and it's a full house. You know, I dream of the day, and I'm not complaining by any means, dream of the day when we're filled to the brim of people coming and declaring the goodness of God, coming and worshiping and, and learning, but also imparting and teaching themselves. And so I see in this verse, it's communicating to me, one, that everyone was buying in. They are buying and they're praying and, and I would assume asking God to pour out what he promised. Number two, that they were united in this cause. You can see here, you didn't see factions. You didn't see Don's prayer group meeting over here and the Pierce prayer group over here and the Fife prayer group in the back. They were all united together in prayer. That's a key piece, that prayer is meant to bind us together and not divide us. You know, we've all had those experiences of those prayer meetings where kind of like Jesus uh, talked in a parable at one point talking about how the, you know, the Pharisees or those would say, I'm glad I'm not like the tax collector over there. You can imagine in a sense at times prayer meetings can happen where you start, maybe start praying about other groups. Maybe they don't have things quite figured out, theology or what have you. But here it shows to me the importance of being united together in common purpose. And we see here in verse 14 that all were welcome. Who was in attendance? We have the followers of Christ, including the women. Now, I, for one, believe and affirm the calling of God on all women in the house. If you're a woman, say amen. <laughs> amen. I believe that women, you women, are called of God equally to men to be able to share and discern the word of God and to give timely words. And I think that was important here, why Luke was, you know, shouting to us through this pen letter that, you know, the women are here too. They're equal and they're to be valued in the place. Let's go to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 uh, for a moment. Leading up to verse 6, Paul is right in the Philippians. He has a good relationship with those in Philippi. And he tells to them, Actually, I'm going to go to verse 2. He says, I ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice! Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests 
to God. And here's the key. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The reason why I shared that passage is that I got to believe the believers in the upper room, there might have been a lot of things they may not have completely wrapped their head around. Maybe they couldn't quite grasp fully everything that Jesus had said. Maybe some of the things just freaked them out. Maybe they didn't know what was about to come. And so they're praying together, united purpose. And like Paul, in that moment, whatever the prayers and petitions, that they're believing that the peace of God will surround them, that will surpass all understanding. And so this morning, I want to encourage you, if you will, as we're going through the scriptures, that we see prayer as a valued discipline that tills the soil of our heart. It's a discipline that tills the soil of our heart so that we can receive all that, ha- that God has for us. Do you want to receive all that God has for you? Amen. This morning, as I was preparing this message, I got to admit, my notes were all over the place, and I was praying. I'm being just full disclosure here. Lord, I don't know exactly, completely, how you want me to communicate this word that you put on my heart. And I asked him to give me the words to speak, but I believe the big piece, that word for us this afternoon is to allow prayer to till the soil of our heart so we can be receptive to what he wants to say and do in our life. So point two here is prayer prepares our heart to receive and reorientates how we approach life. I got to admit, you know, when you face those circumstances, those difficulties, we've all had the good, the bad, and the ugly. I bet if you took a moment to look back at those situations, you could see how there was a shift in the atmosphere when you began to pray. If you really just take a moment to pause, I'm sure some of those moments, those stories will come to recollection. I remember when I had this crazy adverse reaction to the vaccine, my brother was actually there at the, uh, in the ER. John, I don't know if you remember that, but you were working. It was kind of comedic. I'm like, oh, no, John's working. It's okay, don't worry about it. No, you're having a reaction to this vaccine. Well, I don't want to bother my brother. I want to take his you know, eye off the ball. And so I'm in, I'm in the hospital bed, and I'm praying, like, God, I don't know what's going on. You know, and my father always taught me, you know, use these life experiences to ask God, you know, what are you showing me? in this circumstance. So I'm praying, oh God, you know, I'm, I trust the physicians. I trust the medical community. I don't know what is going on right now. And I just began to pray. And I felt this tremendous peace come over me. And I think I shared this when we first started this church plant. The Lord said to me that your life will never be the same. I'm showing you my glory. And so in that moment, I believed he used that circumstance to get my attention that I would continue to completely rely on his leading hand in my life. And see, the prayer allowed to, the, the tilling of my heart allowed me to be receptive to what he wanted to say. And so the emotions of the situation didn't wreak havoc in my thought life and consume me so I couldn't hear the voice of God. Prayer transforms us and enables us to be on fire for God. You look at anyone who's on fire for God, I bet you if they ask them, they're a praying person. If anyone asks anything about my father, like, Ryan, you're, he's always so joyful and, you know, upbeat. We would say, well, he, he's a praying man. You know, countless times on the weekend, he would, in his prayer room, he would close the door to his bedroom. We, even as boys, we'd come knock on the door, hey, Dad, and he'd be praying. You could hear him speaking in tongues. You could hear him declaring, you know, the name of Jesus. And we'd go to mom, like, what's he doing? Oh, he's praying, boys. He's praying. And I so visually remember those moments and times of hearing my father pressing in. And if I can just encourage you this afternoon, don't misunderstand or, or undervaluate the impact that you can have in your children's life. Not just the ones that you're raising yourself, but even in your extended family. If people see you're praying, they're going to take stock of that. It just as equally when they see breakthrough, they're going to take stock of that as well. Now, how many think prayer can be uncomfortable? At times it can be, right? Times we're like, man, I don't even know what to say. My, my whole core has just been shook. Well, we have the promise in Romans chapter 8 that says the Holy Spirit will help us in those moments and give us words, especially when we don't know what to say 
or think. So the role of the Holy Spirit is so important, even when things are uncomfortable. I have to admit again, as I'm reading the beating of Acts and the followers in the upper room, that again, they may not have had everything figured out. Maybe it was a bit uncomfortable thinking like Jesus said that we would receive the Holy Spirit and be baptized with fire. Like, what is that going to look like? I mean, is there going to be physical fire? I mean, is, are the timbers going to catch a flame? Like, what's going to happen? You can wonder, there might have been some assumptions and some guessing going on. But what, like how it got me thinking was sometimes in life, God, he's going to make us uncomfortable for a purpose. Henry Cavill, he's the, uh, the man of steel, Superman. He once said this, comfort is addictive. Give a man comfort and his ambitions will go out the window. The comfort zone is where dreams go to die. And after reading this quote, I like to, you know, spiritualize. I'm, I'm not saying he's a, he's a believer by any means. You can call him this afternoon if you like. But the way I was looking at that quote is thinking that, you know, when we become comfortable... The comfort zone could be the place, as he said, where dreams go to die. I never want to be in a place where God is no longer sharing dreams. He's no longer sharing visions and putting those things on my heart. Maybe because I've, I've allowed myself to not be receptive to what he's doing because I've become comfortable. Because I've become comfortable. And so prayer can bring us into the alignment of God's will and purpose. I know I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. You know, when, when, my, when my father died, I didn't understand what was going on because I thought he had so many years left. He even had shared words, and many of these words have come true. And, and one word, and I'm, I'm going to get it wrong, so I'm not going to try and quote it, but it had not yet come to pass. And I thought, this can't be happening. And in the physical, in, in the flesh, fleshly manner, you know, I was lamenting and not understanding what was happening. But in that moment, these groans within me began to stir up and I began to speak in tongues. And I was reminded of Romans chapter 8. And even though those moments, moments you can't explain, you can't fathom, the Holy Spirit stirs up within your heart and helps you as he intercedes in your deepest, even darkest moments. But we can see here in the upper room, it wasn't a dark moment for the disciples and the followers well, not completely. You know, there were, there were those who were seeking after to kill them, to take them out for following the way of Christ. And yet they had camaraderie. They had this family. So things were good, but things were also bad. But they were trusting in God. They were leaning in and believing that he was going to pour out uh, his spirit. Look at verses 24 through 26, if you will. Actually, let's go to verse 15. Verse 15 for a moment. So this is after they've been praying in the upper room. And it says, In those days Peter stood up among the brothers and sisters. The number of people who were together was about 120 and said, Brothers and sisters, it was necessary that the scripture be fulfilled, that the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of David, foretold about Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Christ. For he was one of our number and shared in his ministry. Now this man acquired a field with his unrighteous wages. He fell headfirst, his body burst open, his intestines spilled out, and this became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, so that in their own language, the field is called Hakalim Diema, that this is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling become desolate, let no one live in it, and let someone else take his possession." And therefore, from among the men who have accompanied us during the whole time, the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. From among these, it is necessary that one become a witness with us of his resurrection. And so now to verse 23. So they proposed to Joseph, called Barabbas, and also known as Justice, and Matthias, and then they prayed, you, Lord, know everyone's hearts. Show which of these two you have chosen 
to take the place in this apostolic ministry that Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lot for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the apostles. The reason why I shared these verses, a lot of things happen. We see what happened to Judas, the, the, the resolution for betraying Christ. But I want to hone in here that these, these people, these followers of Christ, believed that Scripture would be fulfilled. But they didn't want to try and fill in the blanks themselves. They wanted to inquire of the Lord, who would you have us select to take Judas's place? And they began to pray and inquire of the Lord. And that just shouts to me here that when we pray, it impacts not just our resolve, but it informs all our decisions. Here they're highlighting that as we inquire the Lord, that he will inform our decisions, even in things that are man-made. They're casting lots. But God was able to show them who to select, even in those man-made devices. It's no different than when you you have a place of work and you're putting a job out there, a job ad, and you're you're waiting for people to inquire and you want the right person for the job. How many times when you're putting it out there do you pray and ask God, God, who would you have come to this place of work? That's why I love even houses of worship when they pray and discern, God, who would you have come to this place? Who would you have come to minister to us? Who do you have in mind? Sometimes we shortchange, and I think that's why it's included in this process, that the followers of Christ, they didn't lose sight of what was important, to pray and inquire of the Lord of what he wants to continue to do in their midst. And so my question to us this afternoon is, are we listening? Are we allowing the soil of our heart to be tilled so we can be receptive to what the Lord would say to us? Sometimes things are uncomfortable. Look at the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. It says in Acts chapter 2 that some were astonished at what was happening. In fact, there were those who wanted all that God was doing. They asked Peter, what must we do? And yet, there was another group of people. There's always the other group. There were other ones that they were preferring to deny the experience of Pentecost, saying, they're drunk. They're crazy. I want no part of it. So we have two groups. Look at verse uh, 13. When they were meeting and hearing God declare, being declared in their own tongue, they were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, one another, what does this mean? But some sneered and said, they're drunk on new wine. As I was reading this passage and writing notes, I said, Lord Jesus, don't ever let me become or be in a place where I'm too comfortable, where I want to explain you away, where I want to deny what you're doing. And I want to encourage this afternoon to fight the urge to rationally explain things into oblivion. You know, we, we all, we're all smart people. We've been given the mind of Christ. Don't get me wrong. We can discern things. It's not about, you know, entering the things that are folly by any means. But perhaps, I'd submit to you this afternoon, perhaps the best thing that we can do is to expect great things from God. We may not fully fathom what he's doing. We may not fully comprehend. But why not leave the results up to him? Why not say, Lord Jesus, I want everything that you have for me. I believe that's what the followers in the upper room would do, were doing. Lord Jesus, we want everything that you promised. Come invade our hearts. And I mean, he invaded their physical space with wind and fire. And yet there were some who were astounded by it and others who were uncomfortable. And so this account, this event in history became a sign, regardless of how you look at it, it became a signal, a sign that God's spirit was in fact being poured out. There was no denying it. There was no denying it. And I believe that goes the same for us today. Until Christ returns, because the beginning of Acts, we were told by the angels that the same way that he went, 
you will see the Son of Man return. Until he returns, the prophet Joel prophesied that all the whole world would be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? He would pour out the Spirit on all flesh. Your young men would dream dreams. Your old men would see visions. And so let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, for a moment. And then when we profess that God is still pouring out his spirit, we'll see that all these different ministries, giftings, and activities are an agency of the Holy Spirit. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware. You know that when you were pagans, you used to be enticed and led astray by mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God who works all of them in each person. Look at verse 7. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. If the manifestation of the Spirit of God was only meant for a select few, only a select few would have been in the upper room, and only the Holy Spirit would have been poured out on a select few. But, right, the prophecy was for the Spirit of God to be poured out on all flesh, on men and women. And that goes for us today as well. Look, let's look here at verse 8. To one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing. To another, the performing of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. And to another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. One in the same spirit is active in all of these, distributing to each person as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, so also is Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we we're all given one spirit to drink. Indeed, the body is not one part, but many. Look at right at the end there, verse 13. We were all given one spirit to drink. I don't know about you, but I, when I was reading this part, I thought of McDonald's. And just specifically, you go to the beverage machine, you see the different varieties of drink. And, you know, a lot of times we have our, our go-to, right, our go-to drink. And a lot of times I go in and select Barks Root Beer. Okay, maybe someone else goes in there and is going to select Sprite. Graham, what's your drink of choice? Ginger. Ginger ale. Okay, so you go in, you pick your drink of choice, and yet this shouts to me that we have the same one spirit. The spirit is, let's say Bark's root beer, okay? Bark's root beer is the drink of choice, and yet there's all this variety that is being poured out in the body of Christ. But Paul doesn't end there. Paul doesn't end there. He goes in to chapter 13, verse 8, and he's talking about love. That in the midst of all this, the key that balances all this, that binds it all together is faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And he says in verse 8, love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. And Paul here isn't saying that the gifts of the Spirit, or love for that matter, are childish matters. But to the contrary, and in fact, he's saying when the perfect comes, the partial will come to the um, when the partial comes, or the, sorry, when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. Who's the perfect one? Jesus Christ is the perfect one. You could say, well, wait a second. The Holy Spirit's the perfect, perfect one. Well, if that was the case, then the gifts of the spirits would have ceased immediately once they were poured out. 
But Jesus himself said that you'll be baptized with fire when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. So church, until Jesus Christ comes back, he's stirring our heart for us to be receptive to the different gifts from the agency of the Holy Spirit that he wants to distinguish to each one of us this afternoon. But what I love and I want to encourage you with is God is a gentleman. He's not going to force the gifts on you. He's not even going to force breakthrough on you. Let's go to point number three. A praying person experiences breakthrough. I think all these verses, all these passages should shout to us this afternoon or even in a still small voice speak to our hearts and saying that God is not going to back you into a corner and make you to receive anything. But he wants to till the heart, the soil of our heart, that we will be receptive to all that God has for us, all that he wants to give to us. Let's quickly go to Luke chapter 11, if you will. Luke chapter 11, it's a famous part of scripture about prayer. It says, he was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. And so Jesus said to them, whenever you pray, say, Father, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone in debt to us and do not bring us into temptation. And he also said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I don't have anything to offer him. Then he will answer from inside and say, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I have gone to bed. I can't get up to give you anything. I tell you, even though he won't get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his friend's shameless boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Remember that part. I will give him anything because of his boldness. So I say to you, ask and he'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. I love this in verse 11. That the father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. How much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So I ask you today, do you only prefer Barks root beer or do you want the whole variety? You know, I love Barks, but the nice thing with my wife is she's encouraged me over time to try different things, to try different foods. And my brother would probably say amen because he knows how picky I am with different kind of foods. And the same way to internalize it, as I was sharing earlier, is that we can wait at times pigeonhole God and say, no, I prefer this. I prefer things this way. God, if you just order, order it in this way, then I'm all in. Then I am all in. This afternoon, before we go, I want to encourage us and remind us we have this incredible front row seat of all that the Holy Spirit is doing in and through our life. To work and declare the wonders, the majesty of God, and fulfilling all those things around us. Let me ask you a question. Do we prefer to be passengers along for a great ride saying, yeah, I'm, I want to go wherever you want to take me, Lord. It's like a great road trip. Or you're hopping on the motorcycle, Grant, where we're going. I'm going to show you a great ride, Andrew. You just hop on the motorcycle and away we go. So we could be like those at the day of Pentecost that were astounded and wanted all that God wanted to do amongst them. Or we could be like the other group. We could be the co-conspirators, those who want to deny and explain away a genuine outpouring of the Holy Spirit 
And I emphasize genuine. We're not talking about kookiness. We're not talking about people behaving like animals and clucking like chickens. And, and if you're wondering what I'm talking about, look on Google and look where at times the Pentecostalism did go awry. I'm not saying that Pentecostalism is perfect by any means, okay? But if you go look on Google, there's some crazy stuff. But we're all about the authentic move of God's authority, majesty, and love. He wants to pour out good gifts. And it says, how much more will Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So the beautiful thing is, yes, because we believe in Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit. And so because we have the Holy Spirit, my encouragement to you this afternoon is, imagine what he can do in fertile soil. Imagine what he can cause to grow in a pliable heart who's open to the moving of the Spirit. So as we go here today, prayer is a signal. The next time you go to pray, you are putting up a signal flare to God. I'm here, Lord. Speak to me. And on top of that, it's also a sign to others that I care that what God wants to say over me, to me, and through me. I want all that you have for me, Lord Jesus. So I'm going to invite you to uh, take a time here in this moment to pray as we close things out. Maybe you're here this afternoon and you you can say, you know, I am a praying person. I've been praying. I've been waiting for breakthrough. Lord, where is my breakthrough? And I want to encourage you this afternoon that he's not slow in fulfilling his promise, but he uses our circumstances, yes, to get our attention, yes, to have us rely on, on his leading hand, but also he has perfect timing for the best outcome of success. There's a reason why he poured out his spirit at the point in history in which he did. There's a reason why Jesus Christ came at the point in history in which he did. And there's a reason why each one of you were born and seated in a time such as this. Because in the days of this age when people's love will grow cold, he's also looking for those who will be attentive to the voice of his spirit to proclaim the good news to the nations. And your nation is where you are. It's Waterford. It's Simcoe. Wherever you prepare and have established your physical house. And I want to encourage you that his spirit, his energy is with you day in and day out. And so as we go, I want to read again from Luke chapter one. And if you know the words, uh, feel free to to uh, speak in prayer along with me as we look at the Lord's prayer. And he said to them, whenever you pray, say, Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. For yours is the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you.